So hello, everybody. I'm Ignatius Bao. I'm a policy consultant to the National Council for Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, or NCAPIP. And we want to welcome you to this Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month edition of Conversations with NCAPIP. We're really pleased to have some academic partners, as well as some partners from the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association to talk about um, pipeline issues and this question of Asian Americans uh, and Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians in medicine, um, and whether we as a community or communities are overrepresented or continue to have needs, especially during this Heritage Month, as well as um, in recognition of the ongoing hate crimes and violence against members of our diverse communities that are happening, unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and structural racism in our country. So I wanna welcome our panelists. We will continue to follow a similar format through our, as our previous conversations of making this very conversational. Um, but for this uh, month, we also have a poll for the participants. So um, David Lee Hawks will put up the poll and um, I will do introductions as uh, you can rep uh, respond to the poll of your views of whether or not Asian Americans are overrepresented and uh, who you who you are. So our first panelist, uh, we're really honored to have Dr. B. U. K. Lee, who is one of the founders of APAMSA, is a retired professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and the Medical College of Wisconsin. And Dr. Lee is going to start us off with uh, a, a little bit of a historical perspective. We also have on the panel. Dr. Sani Nakai, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity and Community Partnerships at the California University of Science and Medicine School of Medicine. And then we want to welcome our medical school partners, Jay Kang, who is the Asian American Pacific Islander Advocacy Director for APAMSA and is an MD PhD student at uh, Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and Radha Patel who is an uh, MD third year uh, medical student at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Lee and welcome and uh, share with us a little bit about um, the, the origins of APAMSA and um, your perspectives of where we are today. Okay, thank you, Ignatius. This has the growth of APIs in medical schools and medicine is an astounding minority success story. Uh, when I began, uh, it's been a long time, it, uh, we were at a 1.8% in the 70s, observed tremendous growth in the 80s and 90s, and APAMSA was formed in 1995 when APIs were 17%. And now we stand at about 21 to 22.3% a 12-fold increase over the last 40 years, so that now one out of five of today's graduates are of Asian descent. And you just think of that, uh, the, that picture. The visible growth, that is a critical mass, was the impetus for me to envision a PAMSA. And uh, fortunately, the internet had just begun uh, in the year before. And that was really the virtual platform that allowed us to talk, even though we're, there was no physical forum for us to gather. I want to highlight uh, Dr. Jimin Lee, who serves as the president of the uh, Alumni Advisory Board. And both of us have provided continuous uh, sounding board and institutional memory for the last 26 years. So uh, I wanted to highlight a couple accomplishments to give you what a PAMS has done. It was conceived as a national pan-Asian American medical student organization to serve the specific needs of AAPI medical students to support student career and, and career development, bring awareness of AAPI health and provide leadership development. So now we have over 90 active medical school chapters. The executive board is 90 members, all volunteer on top of a very busy academic schedule. We've had 26 uh, consecutive national conferences. The current president is Donna Tran from Michigan State, and our immediate past president is Ying Fei Wu from Medical College of Wisconsin. We have ongoing this month multi-chapter bone marrow drives all across the country. 
We have a signature health project on hepatitis B that started in 2006 and many local projects. I'll just highlight in, in Milwaukee where I'm from, uh, we have an extensive Hmong health pro project on many levels, including mentoring of high school students into health careers. Well, what's the cautionary tale? Uh, despite all the success, all is not as well as it might appear. I will say from my perspective, we are the ultimate model minority as all Asian parents want their children to become doctors, but it's a high misleading image because of an aggregate appearance that we are an quote overrepresented minority. This overrepresented oxymoron obscures the fact that the majority of the 35 Asian under are under uh, subethnic groups are underrepresented and face substantial barriers to admission. The second thing is we are the ultimate invisible minority and one by medical institutions who take AAPI students for granted as white even, who don't need attention or deserve attention. And I will say secondly, even by offices of minority affairs and diversity and inclusion who focus primarily on African-American Latino students. I will give some examples in the discussion. So the consequence of being the model minority, the invisible minority is that we still have many unmet needs and uh, challenges that are specific to API medical students remain unmet. I'll just mention uh, several. Obviously, we have unique cultural issues, a lot around intergenerational conflict. I can give concrete examples later. One of the things I've been very involved with over the last um, uh, 20 years is educational profiling of AAPI students as passive which definitely affects their grades. And this is an ongoing uh, part of the implicit bias against uh, Asian American medical students. And finally, as you've seen, just mushroom over the last year is the open racism in verbal and physical attacks stoked by politics, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. But I think nevertheless, there's even a much more subtle uh, a plethora of um, microaggressions that occur. And uh, I think uh, obviously these have to be addressed and it, it's become very, very timely. So what would I say from the perspective of uh, looking at this over time from the beginning? Uh, I'd say over the 40 years, the improvement for AAPI medical students has changed largely because of the increased critical mass of medical students. So their safety in numbers and the formation of a PAMSA, which has provided a very collegial comfort zone and uh, a source of activity leadership development. But unfortunately, I would say at the institutional level, despite the mantra of uh, promotion of diversity, APIs remain largely, have, have remained largely um, unchanged, the attitude due to the lack of top level API leadership, the bamboo ceiling in medical uh, institutions, schools who can help change culture. Obviously a dearth of data on API medical students and physicians from which to, to base uh, policies on and the really the continued lack of institutional awareness. So I'll stop there and pass it on. I will say to preface my uh, other remarks, there is hope and I'm going to highlight some examples in the discussion. Thank you, Ignatius. Thanks so much, Dr. Lee. So Dr. Nakai, you're now in the middle of uh, a lot of those diversity, inclusion and equity initiatives across medical schools. So uh, please share your perspectives. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate um, the comments, Dr. Lee, and a little bit of the historical perspective, because I, I think that um, our communities really illustrate that representation is not enough. We haven't done anything to alleviate the risk factors that racism really brings to both students, trainees, and our communities. So um, early in my years, when I was the director of diversity at Northwestern, um, we really were not very inclusive of AAPI students. And coming in, I, I was hearing from students the racism that they were experiencing within the institution. And really, it, I, you know, scratching my head saying, why isn't this office being shaped and construed as the place where 
a safe place where people can come and talk about that. And I, I think we don't do a very good job of curating protected space. Um, we have a hard time with those conversations around, well, I wasn't invited and so therefore I was left out um, without really considering the identity intersections that are at the forefront of, of that. And certainly the students that I've worked with, AAPI trainees get called the wrong name mistaken for someone else, experience microaggressions, and, and then there isn't even a welcoming sort of landing pad, or, you know, a, a place to land where someone will, will hear them and say that those things matter, right? Like, so if we're against racism, we should be against that in all forms. And I think the equity practice and inclusion practice at our institutions is, is really lacking. And to your point about the, the projects that APAMSA has been doing, there is a lot of mentoring that needs to happen. We have a ton of language diversity and language barriers in healthcare. Our communities are facing disparities. Um, we need better health education, intervention, public health, um, chronic disease screening for, and a lot of those cultural disconnects deeply impact, you know, communities. So especially in Chicago, I would say, so, so are we in a DEI space where we're talking about representation? and recruitment, or are we now shifting over into working on equity? Because equity is everybody's business. And the erasure of the ways that identity matters in healthcare and as trainees um, is really setting back the conversation for everyone. Um, I've loved the solidarity that APAMSA has demonstrated for Black Lives Matter and for, you know, White Coats for Black Lives. And I think it's a, just a really good um, you know, example of how this group of students and this generation is really coming together. Um, the passing of, of um, Yuri Kochiyama is another, um, you know, sort of thing that's, you know, coming up for me. I saw a few Facebook posts from some friends who were fortunate enough to meet her, an incredible activist that worked with Dr. King, but was famous in enough her own right um, for the amount of social justice work that she did, but yet you know, folks don't know the civil rights leaders um, from our communities. And I, and I think that we need to change that. We need to become much more culturally literate um, about our own histories so that we can expand uh, the equity workspace to improve outcomes both for trainees and for our communities and patients. Great, I, I wanna call out some of the comments of, you know, really, I think the past year, we've all become much more comfortable and secure in calling out structural racism and so that it's not just about race and identity and diversity, but it's really naming that racism and how it's impacted um, on the medical profession. The American Medical Association just came out with a strategic plan to address uh, structural racism within its own organization and organized medicine. And I think that's a bold step forward that um, hopefully others will take up. Um, and I also really want to call out this uh, question of critical mass that Dr. Lee referred to is that, again, virtually we're able to connect more, but I think at schools in our pre-discussion, you know, oftentimes it's only one or two or three students. And so, again, they don't feel that safety. They don't feel those protected spaces, Dr. Nakai, where um, they can support each other. And so that, that's really, really so important. So let me turn to, to Jay um, and talk about a little of your experience at Vanderbilt and then just from the perspective of, of APAMSA, why APAMSA is still needed um, and why we still need to sort of shatter these myths of the model minority and the invisible uh, minority. Yeah, so I, so Vanderbilt is in Nashville, Tennessee. So we are, we are a minority even in our own communities and of course in our schools as well. And so APAMSA has really been the, at least the portal for me <laughs> to even talk about things that are related to people who look like me and health concerns of people who look like me. Um, and it, Dr. Nikkei, I know you talked about, you know, educating ourselves on our history and really this, year has really shown me that of how much sometimes the burden is on the students to be both a historian to kind of know the also be a, somewhat of a statistician statistician because you got to know the admissions rate and things that are the data that's honestly not under our control or some data is doesn't even exist because disaggregated data doesn't exist um, but basically to be all of that, because when we say that we are a minority, 
it is on us to prove that that is the case. And so I think the APAMSA has allowed um, this kind of space where students can, first of all, just heal, just, just pour out <laughs> the emotions that we have been feeling in terms of the feeling of neglect, the, the feeling that clearly we are not, we're, we're not white adjacent um, and that there are clearly some disparities that we may face maybe subliminally um, that we didn't really think about or had the space and person to talk about, um, but we definitely have those moments in the back of our minds. And, and so having that place where you can share the feelings and have that acknowledge itself was big um was a big part of a PAMSA this year and then the other thing is the in terms of almost convincing the school admin in terms of why we are a minority I think um a PAMSA has also been a place where people can gather ideas of where we can do better and what kind of data should we seek out to really make a case for ourselves and this has kind of, um, we have summarized it to kind of the need of obviously the minority, the numbers of cells. So we definitely need those, but also the more qualitative things like mentorship and the acknowledgement that there is bias against us, whether that's in clerkship evals or being considered for roles of leadership and service whether that's you know, being a class officer, being considered for AOA or gold humanism societies and things like that. Um, and those are subtle ways <laughs> that we all, again, we kind of get through med school, but then, and we kind of sometimes even fill that minority quota and definitely feel tokenized to some extent, but then we don't feel like we are being supported to thrive in medical school. And ultimately, I think it is the, we are here to, to thrive. And, and you know, a lot of medical schools will argue that they're trying to raise physician leaders. And sometimes we do not feel like we're being adequately supported to be a physician leader. Or sometimes we even, you know, some people don't believe that we can be leaders, so that's a problem. Um, and, and so when people, people in APAMSA got together to think about ways that we can um, improve our power. So again, uh, Dr. Lee, you talked about numbers. So that is improving somewhat. So at least, you know, there in, and then um, recent events has also been a rather tragic, but definitely a moment of acknowledgement. Um, but in order to sustain this effort um, that is beyond the kind of news cycle, is definitely to identify allies and key, you know, st uh, stakeholders within the school, and also to collaborate um, across different, whether it's with the undergrad side, the undergrad Asian groups, or other um, identity-based groups and campus, and also to tap into past efforts, because a lot of times the admin will wait and students will definitely um, either get busy or graduate and, if, even if they did a lot of the work, oftentimes that just kind of dissipates and goes to nowhere. And so I think that's an even bigger reason for um, all these different identity groups to collaborate together and ensure that the, there's continued effort um, and pressure on admin that we are waiting for change and that we are passionate about change and that we would like our future students to not experience the same things that we did. Oh, Ignatius, you're muted. There you go. Great, and I really appreciate the themes that, again, this is not just about students themselves thriving and succeeding in their careers, but it's also lifting up the community needs. Dr. Nakai also talked about that, of the ongoing disparities uh, that our many communities face. Um, not just the hate crimes and the disparities related to COVID, but just so many other disparities related to hepatitis B and diabetes and so many other diseases. Um, and so again, lifting up awareness of everyone who is gonna be practicing in, in communities about those issues is also so important. So Radha, let me turn to you and uh, 
talk a little bit about your experience and uh, of, of being uh, uh, from uh, a South Asian background and, and what that means in this diversity that we call Asian American and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian. Thank you. So for me, um, as a South Asian student in medical school, um, I did find a community of South Asians and as well as just Asians in general. Um, and so with our, with our school and our situation, um, we saw a need for specific issues in the South Asian community. And we reached out to our PAMSA um, organization on our campus and they saw that need and they saw that, that, we needed, that we needed more diversity and they supported us in our endeavors to create an organization. And so when we brought forth this idea to our administration, it, you kind of got this effect that we were all clumped together, that there wasn't a need for another organization or there's no, there was not a need to diversify more, that we could all just be in one kind of one group. Um, and so for us as just being South Asian, um, we have with very specific like issues that we also want to tackle. And okay, so I saw that and they, wanted to help us through that. And so it just goes to show that sometimes even with administration, they don't see us as individuals. They kind of just see us as a cohort of just people that all can have the same uh, same assistance, same ideals that you just place on them. And it kind of goes back to that whole model minority that they all, that they kind of brand us as these model minorities and that we should be expected to rise above adversity um, without any complaint. And so when we saw that um, via PAMSA on our campus, as well as the South Asian, com South Asian community at Uchilito banded together, and we're working towards um, educating our administration just on how uh, diverse we are and how we individually have these issues and how we um, are just more than just like a number, that we are individuals as well. Great. So I want to go back to Dr. Nakai and we, in our pre-conversation, had a conversation about the MCAS and that there's actually more data that's available about the diversity uh, on the application for medical school that people are able to identify the specific um, ethnic group uh, that they're from, but that medical schools often don't look at that data or use that data. And so again, as uh, physician scientists, we're often set, told, you know, you have to look at data, you have to look at uh, the evidence in front of you. So talk a little bit about, you know, how we might um, collectively work on improving how data gets used when Jay talked about, you know, that students sometimes are in that uh, uncomfortable position of having to advocate and, and work with uh, limited data that they don't have access to. Yeah, so there are 12 subcategories of Asian ethnicities under the larger pan-Asian um, racial, uh, you know, sort of drop-down menu in the MCAS application, and then an opportunity for students to self-identify beyond that just as a, as a write-in. So um, a lot of students may not select subcategory, but for the ones that do exist, um, schools have been collecting that for quite some time and could disaggregate that data for admissions, but, but typically choose not to because the way that we report it um, in, in terms of underrepresentation is sort of, um, I think there's, a, there's kind of a scarcity mindset that we're already working in all these other groups that are underrepresented. So we can't disaggregate this look and look specifically at Laotian and Tongan. I mean, and, and we should, because if, if we're really, if we care about diversity and representation because of its implications for healthcare in our communities, then why are we not doing that, right? The, the language, the cultural barriers, um, other types of, of cultural practices that could be potentially integrated that would get us, you know, much farther. So I think um, I talked with some folks from Apanza a couple months ago, and we're planning on making a data request and seeing if we can get the, you know, like sort of five years of, of application and matriculate data to sort of disaggregate um, that and, and do some cross stats and look at socioeconomic status and parental education and, and sort of make better descriptors of some of these subgroups um, so schools can more closely refine kind of what they're looking for um, in terms of representation at their schools and for the communities that they may be situated in or hope to serve. I also want to say, Ignatius, that you know I talked in the in our pre-meeting too about. In my dissertation, I actually was looking at um, stratification, inequality, and elitism. And I looked at sort of the rates and commented on representation of Asian Americans in leadership. So I did a public 
um, document scraping of profiles of deans that um, I was able to find them for about 115 medical schools. And only three of those big D deans of medical schools were Asian American. They were the least represented group um, next to Native Americans in senior leadership roles, right? So when we talk about representation, where? Where in the sort of layers of the Titanic of the Academic Medical Center um, are we talking about if we expect everybody to, we are running by stereotypes and say, well, you can go over here and you can be a researcher and you can bring in money, but we're not gonna let you run the department. We're not gonna let you run the clerkship. We're not gonna let you be the admissions dean. Um, so we definitely have work to do in terms of leadership development. And I do think that it's symptomatic of the, of the racism that's still alive and well in medicine that we've had representation as Dr. Lee's talked about, but it has not trickled up like it has for other groups. So for, by comparison, six of those deans were black, right? So like, so we have, we have a very different way of kind of looking at representation um, across even just the levels of, of academic promotion um, and leadership positions. So Dr. Lee, I, I wanted to turn to you and talk about that because I, I really see this as that whole continuum from when people start as medical school students and obviously go through residency and fellowships and then ultimately into practice and those that stay in academic medicine, it's really important that there be the faculty members, the leadership and in, in deans and, and chairs as well. Um, so comment about how we can also, again, as a community support um, breaking some of those bamboo ceilings. Yeah, I, I will just comment on Sunny's uh, comment, which is that in many respects, we don't have the data. We don't have uh, the kind of data that would allow us to even advocate. And so part of our, uh, our uphill task is uh, Sisyphean task is not only collecting the data, so we can advocate properly because without the data, we can't. And so knowing which ethnic subgroups are in uh, their socioeconomic status all the way to stratas, you can get full professor and so forth, but the leadership positions that Sunny described are very fluid and people are going in and out, going to another medical school and we don't have that data. So um, I'll just give you I, I'm just gonna say a positive note, uh, despite this horrific um, pandemic, one of the things that I see happening, it reminds me of my college experience wh where I protested the Vietnam War. But for me, that was a watershed movement about getting involved. And if you get involved, you can actually change US policy. And I think what I've seen this year is that um, Asian Americans now subject to racism on video, TV, in communities, uh, obviously New York, Bay Area, and then the, you know, the killings. I think it's been kind of awakening. And I, I see obviously a lot of feelings among the medical students, but I feel not only is there pain, but there is also beginning of a commitment and connecting the dots. So not only saying we Asians, but it's connected to Black Lives Matters. But more than that, we can see the healthcare disparities and connecting the dots with structural racism on, you know, on transportation, food deserts, et cetera, that we, I think as a, uh, a group are beginning to see the bigger picture. And as uh, Sunny talked about equity. And so I do see this potentially this year as horrific as it has been kind of a watershed moment and i do think things are changing and i'll give you just a couple examples uh, rui who is one of our previous presidents he's on the pamsa board he's written uh several letters and editorials on anti-asian racism in uh different journals i uh, ming uh, Lynn from medical college of wisconsin also has been inspired really just this year to develop an AAPI health curriculum for medical students and then use medical students then to educate the institution. So if we have a package, we one, educate the APAMS members, but then we take that and we say, where can we fit it into the curriculum and begin to open that door. And then finally, Lindy Zhang, who's a, um, uh, a pediatric oncology fellow at Hopkins, uh, we're beginning a study characterizing and quantifying microaggressions aimed at medical students because what I realized is that when I take this to my senior colleagues that are very are, are white, um, 
I say, wow, this is eye-opening. I never realized. And if I talk to them about, uh, you know, they say, of course, I'm not racist. But if I can show them the prevalence of microaggressions in the language, where are you from? Where are you really from? You know, you're just like um, your English is really good. If if we can get some traction there with some prevalence data, we, I think we can begin to change the institutional culture. But right now, you know, the institutional culture will say, I'm, I'm not racist. I, I don't verbally assault people. But the, the implicit bias and the microaggressions, a much more subtle, subtler level is something that we have to get at. And uh, so I, I think uh, these are examples of, of things that uh, these are, you know, uh, two residents and a medical student because of this year have just said, I've got to do something. And uh, so I think this could be the beginning of some concerted action to collect data, uh, to really do more advocacy, really join with other groups and really try to understand the big picture. So to me, this is a, at least one of the positives out of this terrible year. Great, thank you so much for some of that inspiration and optimism. So Jane, let me go back to you and, and ask you maybe a, a, an unfair question, which is you know, how can the community help uh, the community of, of physicians, the community of uh, health advocates and those who are working on these health issues and trying to lift them up, how can, we be supportive as a community of those of you who are in medical school um, and facing these challenges on, at this very, very personal level. I would say, I mean, obviously, if you are affiliated with a medical school, I think connecting with the students there um, alone is a big deal because, um, like we say, there is not a lot. And to have someone who looks like you and can you know, be passionate um, or can understand where you're coming from or you can have even shared um, experiences. I think that can mean a lot, but oftentimes that, you know, at least from the student point of view, that may not be um, the case. And so we kind of learn to, to find mentors who in, in, I guess, different parts of your journey and it, you kind of parse out your identity, like, I have my Asian part mentor and they may not be in medicine and you find that or, you know, whatever your clinical area or your research interest, things like that. Um, other thing I would, I would say is I, I, I know that this is like a work in progress, but I know even within a PAMSA, we tend to be very East Asian centric. And I think that's should be said um, and acknowledged and it's really something that every our entire Asian community can really work on is just acknowledging how the other groups are just not <laughs> as represented and um, and because we get so East Asian focused part of that is due to some colorism but I think the other thing is we tend to focus on the things that we experience and we may not have any idea on what what Radha would would experience or what a native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander would think about or what their experience is like going through med school. So e acknowledging even the underrepresentation within the API umbrella, I think is something that we could definitely keep working on. Great, and Rada, uh, any ideas for ways that the broader community of uh, practicing physicians and other advocates and community members can be supportive of those of you who are in medical school? Yeah, so what I would like to say, like Jay is correct, that sometimes we feel that sometimes a PAMSA can be East Asian centric. However, I will say just a PAMSA supporting just a South Asian movement is a, is a great step. It's like, it helps us feel as though we have a spot, we have a say, we have um, our time to speak as well. And I think that's like the best thing you can do as even as a community is just when someone asks for some space or some time to speak, you allow them to have that time and that space to speak. And that we also recognize that people um, interpret adversity differently. They ter interpret uh, microaggressions differently and to be respectful of that. So if someone is saying that Oh, someone asked me where I'm from and I wasn't comfortable with that. It's, it's okay to be like, okay, I understand that you're not comfortable with that and I will be more cognizant of that in the future. 
So I think as just a community, um, just recognizing that even within our community, there are differences in how we perceive um, microaggressions, even macroaggressions, um, and so forth, and just being aware of that and just working kind of like every day to just be more aware of how we interact with each other and just kind of lending a hand out for everybody. So just supporting all, all of us in our community. I think that's the best way we can move forward with this. Great. And so let me turn to Dr. Nakai and Dr. Lee to conclude. What, what gives you hope uh, as uh, we look forward? Again, Dr. Lee, you talked a little bit about out of the, the real tragedy and pain of this past year, um, both COVID highlighting some main disparities among our uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, as well as in some of our sub-Asian communities, the Bangladeshi community in New York, Filipino nurses, um, really understanding those nuances, but then also I think uh, feeling a sense of solidarity and wanting to lift those communities that, as Jay said, historically, we haven't done as good of a job of being inclusive, even among the big AA and HPI umbrella. So Dr. Nakai? Yeah, I would say the things that give me hope are the engagement that I'm seeing. I mean, I've been invited by a PEMSA a few times to talk about how um, leaders at their respective schools can engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion work and sort of finding our place. And I really credit the students with pushing schools to do that better because schools are really not by and large doing it um, as well as they should. And so um, having been a student affairs dean and an admissions dean, I think a lot of this is, is very nuanced and getting clear on, on the mission and you know, making sure that we're selecting students that, that fit with that so that when, when they come, they find camaraderie and solidarity with you know, the students that they're in school with. Um, it really is about equity for our patients. And I think one of the things that is so salient to me is how connected so many of my AAPI and Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander students are with their origin stories and their heritages. And that's a really powerful role model to make sure that we bring with us so that we can remain connected. And I think, you know, in teaching students who are part of, the, say, the white majority, right, to reclaim their origin stories and where, where you're from is really important. But there are nodes of, again, language and acculturation, um, immigration, the challenges a sort of, of adjustment and, and cultural disconnects that really are part of bringing more equity practice, you know, into medicine and into our into our medical education. So I think we have to create more spaces for that. And what gives me hope is is the students um, really doing it um, and leading the way. And, and that's really been the truth for my you know my career is that uh, the students get it and um, they are courageous and I know a lot of boomers and, and Gen Xers are like boo on all those millennials and Gen Ys and iGens. I love them all. I love them all because they just are absolutely fearless and courageous and um, dare to imagine that our world could be could be really different and are not afraid to go after some tools. So um, I absolutely believe that we're going to be publishing some data sketches and, and getting more projects out that highlight the challenges of our communities and make the racism that we've been facing really visible, you know, moving forward. Great. And Dr. Lee? I certainly echo what uh, Sunny says that, that uh, you know, I, <laughs> I'm actually retired now and I, and I sometimes say, why am I still hanging out with uh, medical students, you know, but I, it's the exact same reason as Sunny that you get charged up by the energy enthusiasm. And as I said, I, I think there has really been uh, maybe a maturation. I mean, not all students have energy, but I think there's just been an increasing awareness and desire to do something as a result of what's happened. And uh, some of that is just self-education connecting the dots. And I thought, as Jay was saying, and uh, Radha, you know, even looking within a PEMS and realizing that we have our biases towards other uh, sub uh, ethnic groups and that we think it's kind of an East Asian organization, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that shining a light, thinking about that. Um, and then I, I see uh, the two concrete things is a, uh, a flurry of people who want to take an activism role, but uh, 
you know, how to do it. And so some of them I've directed into specific projects, which are data driven projects, which I think can help change the medical school culture because they're going to always ask for the numbers. They're not just going to, you know, uh, take you seriously because it's right. Uh, they they want to see the numbers. I think the other thing I've seen uh, is more and more medical students. In fact, our last two presidents are uh, one finished her MPH and others getting MPH and a much more professed willingness to work in the community or adjacent or with the community in some way. So obviously, will this translate uh, to the level we know for African Americans and Latinos, uh, medical students, they are definitely more likely than whites um, by, by 50% to 100% to go back to the communities. Uh, whether this will translate in the long run, but we definitely see the uh, the willingness and uh, more interest probably than ever before uh, as a result. So I think between the energy, the mass, um, the continued dedication and desire to do something to address this uh, really makes me very optimistic. Great, and I wanna end with the point of uh, finding our voices and, and sharing our stories. Uh, Dr. Nakai, you talk about, you know, students being so connected to their origin stories. And I think uh, I see this openness in, in journals to really hear those narratives in a different way. I um, mean, and Dr. Lee you referred to some of the leadership of the PAMSA doing some publishing. And I think that's also a really important way of getting this perspective out there. And so again, I think there, there is a lot of hope that uh, different perspectives, different stories, different narratives can also be told um, so that we are, we're not bound by those myths of the model minority or uh, the invisible passive minority or the, just the successful minority. So I wanna thank all our speakers and panelists. Uh, I wanna to turn to David for final words in the post survey and uh, we look forward to continuing the series uh, in June and uh, beyond. And so thanks again uh, for joining us uh, and uh, have a great afternoon and evening.